Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm still in Cuba. Good to have you back again. Today, I have the real Patrick J. Patrick, good to have you in the house, my friend. Thank you for having me on, Cooper. Uh, you know, I, I recently, when you reached out to me, it was like the first time I'd really um, looked into who you are. I think I'd seen your faces in a couple of different places because I know you've been making your appearances on different podcasts. Yeah. But, you know, I was definitely excited for the chance to get to talk to you officially. And um, yeah, man, I'm looking forward to this. Well, likewise, I, I you, you popped up on my YouTube feed and I was like, huh, who's this guy? Raw dating advice. Check out some of your stuff. I was like, oh, there's some good stuff in here. There's some good stuff in here. I'm like, and I and you know, I know my audience always likes to hear from from uh, from dating coaches and stuff. And I don't I don't discriminate. I think like every guy has like that's the thing I like about this sort of this sort of space is that like every guy will have a different background and a different bit of experience uh, set of experiences, right? And they'll they pull on that to give like dating advice. And I think it's good because every like there's no like one perfect way for for any guy because it's like you like when it comes to like dating and learning to attract women and stuff, you got to play with your strengths, right? So it's always helpful for guys to see different dating coaches, different approaches, and learn like or, or, or take something from you know each of them that is kind of appeals to their personality, so they can express themselves the best. I, that's how I kind of approach it anyway. So maybe maybe you could yeah. give my guys a bit of a background about like wh like where you came from, how you started, like where, you know, your, your, what do you call it? Like your rags to riches kind of story or the, uh, your hero's yeah. journey. So everyone can get, get a bit of understanding of, of, you know, who you are and what you teach. For sure, man. Yeah. I feel like this is pretty common. A lot of, among a lot of the people who, you know, of all the things that they could do as a profession, they choose to become a dating or a pickup coach. Um, I would say it's a similar story because for me, you know, I didn't even realize back when I was in college and stuff that, it was possible to go to a bar or a party or a venue and talk to the people that you didn't come with. I thought that was like, you know, a, a thing where like how I met your mother, you have your group of friends and you stay there and you talk to your group of friends. And just like a lot of people, I was classically conditioned by Hollywood and mainstream society that, you know, you got to get girls to like you by being romantic and you got to persist and you got to prove to her that you're the one and you guys are soulmates. And so, you know, that mentality alone, when I was around 21 years old, I was a virgin. Uh, I actually lost my virginity two weeks before my 22nd birthday. Um, and that was almost by almost by accident, right? Because I, I wasn't still good with women after that one time. Um, and it led to me getting friend zoned um, like really hard in a way where I had been talking to this girl, putting in a lot of effort and romance and hanging out a lot and talking and texting every day, like good morning, beautiful shit like that um, to where you know, two girls in a row ended up just completely friend zoning me after six months of like that back and forth. And I had no idea what was going on. And so uh, I actually had friends, you know, that my best friends to this day were polar opposites of me to where they would get laid a lot. And, you know, they were athletic and, you know, they got all the female attention. And then me hanging out with them, I was kind of always in the shadow. I was always the nice guy that the girls would go and talk to, but not because they were sexually interested in. And so for me, it was kind of one of those do or die times where I was like, do I really want to be that guy who's 40 years old, um, has to try to apply to be on the bachelor or some shit just to get a girl, uh, a girlfriend. <laughs> and, and so I obviously didn't want that shit. Uh, and so, you know, I found this thing, someone hit me with an ad, uh, Bobby Rio's ad actually on Facebook when I was like 22, 23 years old, like, do you make these friend zone mistakes? And that was my entrance into like, whoa, there's this whole other way of doing things. And so from there, uh, I, I wouldn't re necessarily attribute it to their program specifically, but um, just that moment, it was like, you know, the floodgates open. I took massive action my, in my dating life um, to where I was just approaching girls every weekend. And so um, shortly after that, I moved out to Arizona, got accepted to dental school. Um, but in dental school, I was still going out five, six nights a week. Um, in Old Town Scott. And that's where I really developed a lot of my game. And eventually I dropped out of dental school to go full time and, and you know, start a YouTube channel about picking up chicks. And so here I am today. And Scottsdale, we were saying this before we we, uh, we went live, like Scottsdale is one of the hotspots in uh, in the world. I, I've driven through Scottsdale. I've, I, I, I was there for like a little bit, like when I first came to America. I think Scottsdale is premium when it comes to the ladies. Uh, it's like It's like one of those places in America that's just like, the girls, for some reason, 
And maybe it's the university. I don't know what it is. But for some reason, in Scottsdale, there's hot girls there. Yeah, I don't understand what it is either. It's almost like, you know, especially because I, I, I came from Kansas. It's almost like you took all the hot girls out of Kansas and they all just moved to Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of like, you know, it's like the girls in Scottsdale, it's like a fine balance between they're really hot and they're like, they could be working in Vegas or LA, but they're not quite big enough to go there yet. And so it's like you get the girls right before they get completely tainted by the LA or the Vegas scene, you know? Yeah. You know, I, I had this conversation with a friend of mine recently about like big cities like New York, Miami, like uh, um, Los Angeles, right? And the the what happens with girls is they get they get like this exposure to like uh like the player type dudes they get expo this exposure to do like the the fast money guy the scam the credit card scammer the like wannabe rapper the whatever like the the i the renting rented Lambo guy or whatever right they get in in the space of like five years or maybe even I think he was saying like three or four years or whatever in one of those big cities they get the same amount of exposure to that those kind of fake dudes as they do for like. 10 years in like another big city and so they become like women end up with like a sort of defense mechanisms really quickly in those bigger cities because they've, they've had so many dudes like faking it uh, mm -hmm. in, their, in their dating history in, the, in just a, such a short amount of time i think that i found I, that insight i thought damn he's not wrong like that's <laughs> and which is which is why in like bigger cities it tends to, like girls tend to be more like on guard I guess when yeah. it comes to dating, when it comes to dudes approaching them, talking to them, and stuff like that, versus like, you know, if you went to Kansas, <laughs> it might be a bit easier to sweep a girl off her feet. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, I guess there's definitely pros and cons. Like, if I if I learned a lot of my game here in Scottsdale, just taking massive action, you know, I'm used to a certain standard. Like a seven here is very different than a seven in Kansas, yep. and so it's weird yep. because you gain the confidence with women who are of that caliber here because it's kind of the average. But then you go back to Kansas and you get girls to where these girls, you wouldn't even notice them in a bar out here. But because they're the hotter girls in Kansas, they have this same entitlement of the hot girls out here. Yeah. Um, but it's also interesting because I realize like just my internal confidence level because I'm going back to Kansas. I don't like I just know that I can do just as good, if not better than her. And regardless of her entitlement, you kind of learn like, oh, it really is a lot of times, you know, as cliche as it sounds like that inner confidence, having a strong frame. Because, you know, I, I can still land a girl like that in Kansas, regardless of the entitlement level. And so um, I think one of the things I mentioned before, you know, we hit record was I tell my guys all the time, if you can if you can go to a place like Scottsdale and like consistently succeed with women from cold approach, you can do it anywhere because like. Vegas, for example, you know, I go to Vegas, you might see the same caliber of women, especially if you go out during the week, if you're on the weekend, you never know what you're going to get with the bachelorette parties that are in town. But the mentality is very different because everybody there is on vacation. It's like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So inherently by going out in Vegas, there's almost al already that like, I'm down for adventure. Whereas here, you know, you get the same quality of girls, but um, they're not on vacation. And so they're in their everyday lives. So that mentality isn't there to where, you know, like you said, the defenses are naturally up in a place like Scottsdale. And so that's why I freaking love this place, you know? Makes you, what's the, what's the expression? Iron sharpens iron. It makes you like, makes just makes you a sharper weapon. <laughs> For <laughs> out, sure. Out, out in the field there. Yeah, man. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, that comes with, with uh, rejection too. Like, you know, it's kind of dog eat dog out here. I can't tell you the amount of times because it's happened so many times where, you know, I've I've been on a date with a girl on a Tuesday evening and we're at some low key dive bar, but it's kind of cutthroat out here to where some guys, you know, if you go to the bathroom, she already has dudes approaching her. And I've actually lost a couple of dates like that, too. So just the element of being as cutthroat as, as it is. Um, yeah, man, you 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 learn real quick out here for sure. Do you uh, do you feel like you get the majority like is your fan base on the porn sites mostly women i'm assuming or is it the guys who kind of follow the male porn star as well it's dudes it's a combat it's mostly uh like it, like in terms of most straight male porn stars their fan base typically consists of primarily gay dudes gay dudes and bisexual dudes who just like who just like to see like straight dudes doing their thing and then like mm -hmm. your hardcore porn fans who just sort of like what we do on camera and sort of support us, I guess, is a way of saying it. Yeah. yeah. 
So that's what it, so these days my my social media is this weird combination of like it's like half like gay men who who you know fanboy over me and then half like straight dudes who just want advice and it, and like so my comment sections on my Instagram and on my Twitter are hilarious sometimes cuz it's just these two two very polar opposite kinds of guys. Dang. Yeah, I can't even imagine that like in my business, the way the way that I make money, you know, giving dating advice, I literally don't ever interact with with gay dudes unless they're in denial or something, you know. Yeah, I mean, I ain't got a pro- I mean, and I am I ain't got a problem with them. They're, they're fans of mine, cool, great, like they're supporting me. And and to be honest, like the the sex advice I give is, I mean, at least with it, when it comes to like the performance anxiety or like premature ejaculation stuff, like that applies to them as well if they want to they want to they want to use it, you know. So it's not like uh, uh the the stuff I teach is is, is can be. Ex- well, when I'm teaching about dudes how to like hit the, find the G spot and how to eat pussy, probably that's kind of not relevant to them. But <laughs> there's a whole bunch of other stuff I can teach that they can they can steal if they want to. So yeah, I'm curious because I've always heard this and I've never actually known. I guess I've never had the chance to ask uh, someone who's actually in the industry. Is it true that if you're a male porn star, that to get big you have to work your way up by doing a bunch of gay scenes first? No, nah. there are some dudes who have done that. There absolutely are, but they. Here's the thing: they they tended to the guys who have done that. That was kind of before social media. So, because mm. there's actually a, less of a stigma nowadays, but they're like you know in 2021, but there was for a, quite a while there was a big stigma around a dude who we call them crossover performers, dudes who went from being in the gay side of porn to being in the straight side of porn uh you know that's it's purely based around the, the the stigma is based around like hiv infection rates and and things like that uh but nowadays they've got they got drugs like prep which which stop transmission of um hiv and stuff like that so the stigma's kind of dropped off a bit but people because of social media everyone know every like if a when a dude tries to do that like everyone knows that they they did gay porn before whereas back like 10 15 years ago they didn't know. They didn't, unless they sort of had heard the rumor, they wouldn't even have really even known if the dude had done gay porn before, before he tried moving into like the straight stuff. Or at least the fan base definitely wouldn't, you know? Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, but you don't, I didn't do that. I, I started out like the way I got in, I started out with s- small studios in Australia. And then I leveraged that experience and I shot in England with some slightly bigger studios. I ended up getting booked for some big names like Brazzers and Fake Taxi out there. And then I got flown mm-hmm. out to, to uh, Budapest and I shot out in Budapest for a few months. And then I ended up, yeah, using connections out there and then got some stuff in Los Angeles and uh, and the rest is history. And I've been out in America for like three years doing that. That's awesome. Yeah. And so like with with your whole thing that you do now as far as like helping guys in the bedroom, did that come from you you know, having to learn through those high pressure situations? Like, did you struggle with some of that anxiety yourself? Oh yeah. Like you, it's, it's this weird thing. It's, it's a combination of like, like me, like figuring shit out because you, if you have a bad day, like on set, okay, cool. That's one bad day. Like you can't have a bad day the next day. Like you don't really get a second chance in our industry as a dude, you have you, you especially the, you have to nail the first scene. That's something very important for, for dudes who mm. get into this industry. You have to absolutely nail your first scene with any new director you're working for. Cause then he'll hire you again. Then mm. you got a little bit of, le- you got a little bit of leeway. You might be able to like have one bad scene, you know, later on down the track. And then he still might hire you again. You know, you get, you get, you get basically one bad scene. Yeah. What's their criteria for a good scene and a bad scene? Like you just well, get like, extra hard that day. Yeah, it's basically like, can the dude keep his dick hard? That's basically the criteria, because uh, that that is the thing. Like most guys think, here's the thing that most guys don't understand. They think, oh, I'll just take a Viagra, and mm. it'll magically like there'll be no problems. Here's something that most guys and I tell guys a lot. I tell guys this all the time. Viagra does not give you a boner. Viagra just keeps it there for longer. Mm. So, if you're petrified and you're like really anxious, you can pop a, you can pop as many little blue pills as you like. If if you're like in your head and anxious and nervous, old boy ain't rising to the occasion. It's, mm. it's just it's just the name of the it's, a, it's just the reality of the situation. So, yeah, like a a, a good scene is basically one that gets finished. <laughs> a bad scene is one that the dude can't get his dick hard and like everyone goes home without a paycheck. So you were uh, like 
I had a couple. I like I was I was actually quite lucky. I sort of started off in with like easy studios to work for, and so I mm-hmm. built up like six months worth of experience under like relatively lower like lower pressure situations in our industry, and then so I sort of learned like okay what things do i like what things can i eat before a scene or like the day before a scene that help me the next day you know what i mean what kind of foods are good what kind of exercises can i do to help like my body perform better like how can i improve my testosterone levels and optimize those i was learning all this stuff as i was going along and more importantly i was picking the brains of more experienced guys because when you go so you if i go to set typically like a director is going to shoot two two scenes in a day right mm. Well, the AM scene and the PM scene, and so when you switch, when when you when I come in for the PM scene, the AM dudes uh, like he's they're wrapping up that crew's wrapping up, and so I'll cross paths with guys, and we'll get we'll you know you'll have like an hour or two to sit down and chat with people, and yes, yeah, so I'll pick the brains of dudes who are you know twenty year veterans in the industry, and then you learn a thing or two, you learn a few tricks here and there, and over the, and you just accumulate this sort of tool toolkit. And you, you make you know make a mental note. Oh, he does this. He does that. You accumulate a toolkit, and then you you've got all these things you can pull out of the bag if you need to to help you know help old boy downstairs uh, stay strong. So it's not just me. It's a, it's the fact that I like like I'm a I I I I'm good at recognizing patterns, and I'm a learner. So I steal from as many people as I possibly can to make make my job uh, like a lot easier, basically. Yeah, steal like an artist, as they say. Yeah, what's that? Yeah, that's the that's the saying. Like all the all the greatest, all the best artists in the world steal. Now, uh, there was something I wanted to, I wanted to touch on with you, which was like, what what? Okay, because because you you teach like the front end. Oops, we'll we'll, make, we'll wait for this uh, camera to come back on. We we mentioned this before. Yeah, all right, um, we're back in action. Yeah, I gotta refocus. Boom. There we go. Awesome. Now, cool. I know I know what some of the most common mistakes that dudes make on like the the, the second half, shall we say, right of the of the man to woman interaction experience, the bedroom half. I know what some of the most common mistakes those guys are uh, they make. I'm curious what you what, in your experience when you're teaching guys like how to go out there and, and cold approach and talk to girls. What, what are the, some of the most common like mistakes, sticking points, however you want to phrase it, that you see from men? nowadays yeah man uh if if i guess maybe because we're talking about the sex conversation right now um the ones that come to mind right now for me i would say ironically probably translate to the bedroom you know Mm -hmm. things like being in your head that's a very common thing and if you're in your head in the bedroom i'm sure this guy also is in his head in conversation especially if he just approaches girl um one of the things that you know the ways this manifests is like you know, if I tell a guy, all right, see that girl over there, go go over there and approach her. You know, it doesn't matter how many times I can demonstrate how to approach a girl. Um, if a guy wants to, like, I've had it happen so many times where a guy will stand up, he goes, all right. And then his just feet don't move. And so he doesn't actually take that first step because he's all up in his head. The moment he stands up and he goes, right, I'm going to do it. What's the first thought? Well, what do I say when I go up to her? And yeah. so like as a coach, I know that, you know, okay, if you're getting in your head before you even start walking towards her, then what's the best way to do that? Everything I do uh, when I approach a girl, every tactic of mine is really just a way to keep me out of my own head. Like, for example, mm. my the way I approach a girl, if I have to walk 20, 30 feet to walk up to a girl, I'm intentionally going to not try to think of anything to say because the moment I start – uh, you know, it almost never goes according to the way you imagine in your head. Right. And so one of my rules just for myself is like, when I lock eye contact with her, something's going to pop into my head and I'm just going to say that and then just go from there. Right. And that's a very different strategy than a guy going, all right, I need a uh, plan a plan B and plan C of what to say when I walk up. Yeah. Um, but then even that, if a guy can get past that, you know, it's the lack of conviction. It's the lack of, you know, that he's almost pulling his punches, almost like that, that bedroom anxiety to where he can't get it up is like, you know, I've seen guys, okay, they walk up, they approach her, but you know, they start blabbering away and they walk up behind her. They don't even get her attention first. And I'm like, eye contact first. Um, I'm thinking of one specific example. It was in Tempe, Arizona. Dude walked up to a girl who I just got done talking to. And I knew she was in a good mood. She was here to socialize. She was a cool person. And I said, all right, yeah, man, go up and say hi to her. And he walks up and he doesn't even like stand in front of her. He walks up behind her and he goes, hi, I'm Steve. 
I'm Steve. And he's like a fucking mosquito buzzing in her ear. She didn't even know some dude was talking to her. She's like, what, what? And then he walks back up to me and he goes, I tried it and it didn't fucking work. I'm like, bro, <laughs> like, you know? So, I mean, I would, I'm, I would assume that a lot of that translates to even in the bedroom too. Dude, it's, it's, it's weird. When I, when I talk to, you know, uh, other dating coaches and stuff and I, I'm, we sort of compare notes and stuff, there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I teach in the bedroom, which is stuff that you guys might teach practically in the field. Like one, one perfect example you just mentioned there was like, is like vocal tonality, like projecting your voice, like talking, you know what I mean? Because there's, mm. there's a right way to, to whisper and there's a wrong way to whisper. And there's a right context in which to whisper and there's a wrong context in which to whisper to a girl, right? Like a good context is like, okay, well, I mean, I'm, I'm practically in the bedroom is like, like pulling her hair, whispering in her ear, like choking her, whatever the hell you're doing, like doing it there. But not 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 in a loud, crowded bar when she can't possibly hear you. But I teach guys like stuff like, okay, the importance of your vocal tonality, like deeper, slower, seductive in the way that you talk. And not necessarily like, yeah, you can you can dirty talk in the bedroom. But a lot of guys, I tell a lot of guys, they they worry about kind of like what to say. <laughs> same same situation, right? Instead of worrying about what to say when they go up and talk to a chick, they worry that they, they ask me like, "What do I say when it comes to dirty talk?" And I'm like, "Well, look, if two the first two bits of advice I'll tell them is like one, just don't think about what to say. Just 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 describe what's happening. Then you have to think, you know, like describe your sensations and describe her sensations to describe what's going on. Like, you know, oh my god, you feel so good. At, you know, I don't want to be too graphic on your channel, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, oh my god, I love the way you, I love I love the way you stare at me when you suck my dick, or whatever the hell it might be. Like, describe what the hell is going on with your words, and then you don't have to think about shit, right? And then the other thing I'll tell guys is, as sort of re, uh, um, like homework they can do, right, to learn to be better at dirty talk is read erotic novels that are written by women, because then mm. you see the way that women like to describe sexual fantasies and then you learn that it's basically it's a lot of adjectives if i'm being if, if you break it down it's really just a lot of adjectives and so then you learn how to describe stuff to a woman and describe a few like you could be with a woman and having sex and just and whispering in her ear describing the next time you guys are going to have sex you know, I'm gonna take. I'm gonna take you behind the dumpster. And I'm gonna bend you over, and no, everyone's gonna be walking past, and they're gonna be watching you being being my dirty little slut, or whatever it might be, right? Mm. That's that's uh uh. Because I'd rather tell, I'd rather a guy start off like really basic and like, okay, just describe what's happening. So he learns to be confident, learns a bit of confidence with projecting in the bedroom. Because a lot of guys just don't have the confidence to do it. They're, they're worried about saying the wrong thing. They're worried about, worried about looking stupid, and they don't have that confidence. And, and a lot. Like there's so much parallel here with all this stuff because trend like women, from my experience, like when you approach them and when you talk to them, like in real life before the bedroom, they're interpreting like what you're gonna be like in bed. They're judging like that that approach and that and that way you you talk to them. They're using that as like a litmus test for what's this guy gonna be like if I go home with him. And so, if you're if you're if you have a timid voice, bad body language, like you don't make eye contact with her, she's gonna immediately translate that to this guy is gonna be terrible, like you know, bad in bed and and not confident and shy and meek in the bedroom. And I think that's that's something that guys sort of, at least for me, that helps to understand like how to communicate with women that I want to attract, like. If, if I'm talking with her, she's like she should be kind of aware that there's there's if she sticks around, she's in immediate danger of getting dicked down, because that's kind of where it's going to head, you know. If I keep if I keep talking to her, and there's this idea of, um, it, touching on what you that example you gave a second ago, I talk about this a lot. This idea of congruence, like c being congruent, is super important because congruence is like okay, my thoughts, my words, and my actions are all kind of in alignment, right? So if I go up and talk to a chick. But I like that's a confident action, right? But in my head, I'm thinking, "Oh Jesus Christ, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm really nervous." And then when I talk, it's like, "Hey, how you doing?" Like that's not congruent, right? And especially, and yeah. one of the things I'll find is that, like, dudes who are really, really good looking, right? People talk about, 
oh, like good looking guys have it easy, et cetera, et cetera, right? When it comes to chicks, if a good looking guy goes and talks to a woman, she expects him to be super confident versus like a regular looking guy. She kind of doesn't expect him to be as confident. So he actually kind of has it a bit easier because like she's got a, uh, she has less expectations in her head for like an average looking guy as opposed mm. to like a, a super good looking guy. Some like, because I had a couple of friends back when I was growing up who were like super good looking, but shy with chicks. And it was just like devastating because like if they did try something, but they weren't, they didn't have that super, super confidence behind them. They would strike out versus like average Joe over here. who was like a football player who had confidence. He'd roll in he's like, what's up? And then bang, like it'd make things work, you know? Yeah. And the worst thing about those super good looking dudes is like, I, I, I would consider myself in that category because I've always been in sports. I've always been like six foot three. Um, but I could never get girls. And so I relate to guys who even come to my boot camp to where, you know, I look at them, I go, dude, like you're a good looking dude. Like just, you know, why can't you do it? And uh, that's like the worst thing you can tell a guy looking, but he doesn't know how to behave in a way that attracts women because it doesn't really offer anything to him. So I can definitely yeah. where you're coming from on how they almost have it sense. And you know what? It's funny. Uh, like, I see all these memes all the time about like giving. Uh, this is this. I think it's a TikTok trend right now. It's like uh, giving that the ugly guy a chance is the kind of like the meme. And they they talk about like the ugly dude who can like lay pipe properly, or like the average looking dude who can lay pipe properly, and then the girl just gets addicted to him. And that's something I I tell guys a lot is like sec good, being good in the bedroom is this tool is a really good tool for retention for ret for keeping a girl you know like keeping a girl around keeping her as a, as a as a fuck buddy if you wanted to do that or keeping her as a girlfriend yeah. or whatever it might be like uh, like having good uh, dick game for whatever better word will will do will go quite a long way in like keeping a girl around even if you even if you were like you know simpy or or whatever like you know if you had like didn't if you don't have like the best uh, like frame control in the relationship, you don't have the best relationship dynamic, whatever it might be. Like, good dick game can actually can take you. Quite, it won't get, get get you everywhere, but it can take you quite far. You know, while you figure out all these other uh, weaknesses in your in your life, I guess. Yeah. Let me ask you this: Does size matter when it comes to your uh, ability to dick down a girl? Okay. So, uh, here's an interesting uh, observation. Because I get asked this question a bunch, and I have polled my co-stars on these on this question. And one here's the pattern I noticed, right? When dudes talk about like, okay, what's a big dick? They talk about length. When women talk about what's a big dick, they're talking about girth. This is mm. I've, this has been proven time and time again with conversations I've had with porn stars on this on this channel on this very on on my channel as well. And it's the it's because because for her it's like. It's it's a sensation of sort of being stretched out, right? So the thicker a dude's dick is, like she will then call that a big dick. Whereas like long ones, it's kind of like if it's like a thin long one, it's just kind of poking her. You know what I mean? Uh, and so yeah. it might it might hit the cervix, and some girls like like having their cervix punched. Good for them, uh, but it can be kind of painful for 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 most women. Mm -hmm. So it uh, having a thicker penis can can definitely help, yes. But in terms of length, it's there, there is there is such a thing as too big. That is absolutely true, and and you can ask co-stars. Not every girl is a complete size queen. Uh, some actually find it painful if it's like super super long. But the other thing is, you can. It's it's more about angles than anything else, because just mm. pure like size ain't gonna do too much if you're just like at at, at a shitty angle. So. One of the things I'll teach guys is like as a perfect example, like there's a lot of things, a lot of slight variations you can make to basic sex positions, which significantly improve them. So a real basic one is in missionary position, you slide pillows under the girl's hips and you raise her hips up, right? So you're changing the angle of penetration. Let's see if I can do this properly. So normally like her, her pelvis is sort of laying like this. And then if you put yeah. uh, um, pillows under it, bang, it's like this. So your angle of penetration is now the head of your dick is hitting her G spot, right? Whereas before, it was it's kind of going in at a, at a it's missing the G spot by going downwards right raise your hips bang you're hitting the G spot little things like that like that if a dude has like a below average penis and he does that he she feels like he has a bigger dick you know I and see. so 
his size doesn't actually matter. It, what matters is his ability to manipulate those angles if he really wants like to to you know blow a girl's mind. And another thing I'll I'll say is that uh, <laughs> if you have a really tiny dick, <laughs> you have effectively two other penises right here on the end of on the end of your arms. Learning learning how to use these how to use these bad boys properly and learning how like if you really want to blow a girl's mind, learn how and and you have a, a tiny appendage. Learn how to fist a girl properly. No, no, uh, that, that might sound kind of crude, but uh, there's a correct way to actually fist a girl. And I, te- I, I teach the guys this. You can you can learn how to hit the uh, what I call the A spot and the O spot, which are like back at the at the back of the vagina around the uh, cervix. If you can learn how to do this properly, you are going to give her an experience that no other man has ever. I guarantee no other dude has ever thought about giving her. Is it because only perverted guys like me who do this shit? <laughs> you go, you go, go shoving their arms in women <laughs> i'll be honest i uh i don't think i've ever seen a video of someone getting fisted maybe i'm just not sexually adventurous enough so i didn't know that was a thing exactly exactly <laughs> but i've done Dang. it <laughs> i've done it, I've done it. I've done it in my personal life and i know the results that this could get so that's why i'll tell I, i'll tell little i'll tell guys who actually are like you know below average like well don't don't stress too much about it because you there's a lot of things you can do which can blow her mind. And and p- part of that, a big part of that is like, I mean, this kind of ties into, into uh, you know, cold approach and stuff, is your ability to lead a woman through the sexual experience, right? In the bedroom, because a lot of guys will sort of, they, they, they tell me they're, they're not really sure what to do. Like, what should I do? Where should I start? How do I escalate? How do I, how do I get, how do I, as a question I get all, a lot of times, how do I get a girl to do this thing that I like in the bedroom? Right. Well, you all you know. Obviously, we're talking about like a consensual sexual arrangement. I'm not. I'm not trying to get guys to go out here and do anything that's non-consensual. But basically, like you lead her there. You tell. You show her, and you tell her. Like you. You lead that experience. Like you know. It's. I. I'm not a big fan of, you know, like, uh, like asking for permission, like per se Mm. in the bedroom. You know, because that yeah. is a, that's a very unattractive thing. If we're being perfectly honest, it's a really unattractive, like, trait for for a guy to be like, "Oh, can I can I touch you here? Can I?" T-? If you if you are yeah. already making out and and having sex, cool. Like, obviously, not every girl likes you know, like stuff in the butt, for example. So maybe there's certain things where you might be like, test the waters out, right? But for the most part, if you're having sex with somebody, you, sh- you don't necessarily need you don't need to be like. Can I touch your elbow? Can I touch your neck? Can I touch you on the knee? Can I, you know, baby stepping this consent all the way? So I will tell guys, look, because a lot of dudes are so afraid, man, in this day and age with like the whole Me Too era and stuff, they're actually terrified of, uh, you know, leading and taking charge and and being like dominant in the bedroom. And mm. I'll tell, I tell them, I'll tell them to do one or two things, like really basic shit, like okay, like. Pin a girl's hands down, like behind, like in missionary position. You're, you're on top of her. Just do this one little thing, not not super forceful, not, not 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 you're not hurting the girl, but just pin her hands like that by her side. And you, I, can tr- I will tell this to dudes who've never done it before. And that for me, that's a kind of vanilla. That's kind of a vanilla thing, because you're not, yeah. you know, if you want to, if you want to move her hands, you let you let her hands go. It's not a big deal, right? But just <laughs> pin them there around the wrist like that, and watch her eyes roll in the back of her head the moment you do that, because she's gonna be like. Yes, finally, a guy who's taken charge. Finally. It's just, it's, because yeah. guys are so afraid of it. And it's you, almost you, like the more, the more alpha women who are like super type A personality, they almost enjoy it more because guys are a lot less likely to do it with them in the first place. Absolutely, man. And here's the thing. I, I, I've dated a few girls who've been in my life who are dominatrixes. Um, you know, like they're paid, they, they, dudes pay them to, put cigarettes out on their balls and shit like this, oh, you know, <laughs> they tie them up and, and, and or they tie dudes up and they beat, they beat the shit out of dudes. Uh, but when they come home, to, when they've come home to me, they're submissive, you know, cause the same, and the same thing, same exact thing is with girls who are, you know, like high power CEO women or like business women who have to, who have to spend all day in charge and being the boss and blah, blah, blah. They just want a dude to like take them and ravage them when they get home yeah i mean most women want that i mean in my experience basically all women want that but even more so if like you said if they're in that kind of a power position that type a personality woman do you do you find that guys do you find 
when you're teaching guys to do cold approach that they get kind of that this idea this kind of like me too idea is a bit in the back of the head and they're a bit they're a bit uh, like intimidated to to even sort of talk to girls and like lead them by like say for example like <laughs> hold their hand and walk them somewhere yeah um you know i was i actually was thinking about this while you were talking about that i wonder if you know some of it is the me too stuff but also i wonder how much of it is just that's what they think women want like mm. for example um i've been uh, i'm working on a new video where i'm breaking down a lot of the scenes from this new show called f boy island um okay. and have you heard of that show? No, I have not. <laughs> okay. The show's pretty cool. It's like a combination of The Bachelor with that uh, Too Hot to Handle show. Um, but there's like three women and there's a bunch of dudes. And before coming on the show, half the dudes self-proclaimed themselves as nice guys. And then the other half self-proclaimed as F-boys. Okay. And the girls have to choose a guy. And then at the end, you know, they have to figure out, is this guy an F-boy or a nice guy? Self-proclaimed, right? And one of the things that I'm noticing is that all the guys who are nice and they consider themselves to be nice, these are the types of dudes who are, they'll be on a date with a girl, one of these girls, and they'll be asking, would it be all right if I kiss you right now? Right. Versus, you know, the F boys, the guys who have a little bit of experience, if the vibe's there, they're just going to go for it. Right. Yes. And so that's like one of the main differences I'm just noticing on the outside looking in from that show. Right. But then I relate to my own experiences and I think, well, back when I was a virgin, when I got friend zoned by the girls that I liked, I thought it was chivalrous to not mm. want to sleep with her because I'm a gentleman. I thought it was chivalrous to let her be the, the one who's I'm putting her on a pedestal because she's a princess, you know? And so I wonder if how much of it is just the mentality that they think is working versus, yeah. you know, the, you know, the, the me too stuff, the fear of that. Yeah. This, this, yeah, this sort of narrative, this like Disney Hallmark movie kind of narrative that we, we get fed basically like our whole lives until like until we find out wait a minute this is a total bullshit like she doesn't she doesn't want me to like you know yeah do, like buy her flowers buy her chocolates and 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 text her a million times a day uh, and be like super needy and and creepy she actually wants the complete reverse of that uh and i'll, I'll i agree with that i'll tell i'll tell dudes like and, and maybe you're all right maybe because a lot a lot a large part of uh a lot of the uh what how do i phrase it like but maybe a bit of resistance that I'll get to some of my ideas is guys who think that women are these like delicate princesses, these delicate flowers that like, oh, if I if I touch her, she's gonna she's gonna break into a million pieces. And it's like, no, no, dude, like you can actually be pretty heavy handed, obviously in a consensual way. You can actually be pretty heavy handed with women, and they they quite like that. They like to see that physical dominance. They like to see that masculine strength from a guy. That's that's that is attractive. That is what turns them on. Like you, and you re, you read women's sexual fantasies. You read books. A really good book for for guys who are to kind of break guys out of that mental framework is the book uh, My Secret Garden by Nancy Friday. Mm. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But, I've heard uh, a lot about it, but I have yet to check it out. I need to though, because you know, here's another example. You're bringing it up, and uh, I've heard so much about how that translates to the bedroom for sure. It's juicy. It's juicy. It's it's basically like. This woman uh, was a New York Times author, I think, and she asked women to write in anon anonymously write in their sexual fantasies, and it's just a collection of those, and it's some pretty perverted, dirty stuff. And you're like, you, I, I read it when I was in my uh, my early twenties. I was like, damn, this is crazy. Like these girls are like dirtier than I am, you know. And you you're taught your whole life like that guys are the more like sexual ones, and guys are the more like kind of perverted ones. Yeah, our sex drives might be might be higher than women's. But they're not. We're not. They're not necessarily less perverted than us, which I think really helps guys mm -hmm. understand yeah. how to be better lovers. One of the things that you were talking about, I think, is kind of related. Is just like not being a, like not asking for permission, but more just like leading in the bedroom, especially. I realized that my sex got a lot better, and like women were coming back for more, or they just seemed to enjoy it more when, rather than like trying to, trying to like figure out how to get her to take off her pants. I rather just like said, take off your pants. You yes. know, I started telling her what to do. Like you said, <laughs> dude, it, it's, it's not, it's not rocket science. Really? <laughs> it's just like, but I think guys are a bit of, are, are, like, is it, like if a girl's in, like if a girl is actually into you and like you are, especially if you're already having sex, just, you could, you can just ask for the things you want. You know, it's not, it, if a girl likes you, she wants to please you. And I think guys forget that. 
that w- women there's a big part of the female ego that gets off on getting guys off that gets off on being a, a bit of pleasing a guy in the bedroom mm-hmm. women will get off on that idea because he because the opposite of that if you if you're with a girl and you don't orgasm it drives them nuts like they they can't like if you orga- if you don't orgasm with a girl on your first on you know the first time you have sex with her or something like that, sometimes no matter all the time, but sometimes they'll develop a bit of a complex about it and they'll be like, "What's wrong with me? What did I do wrong? What's what? Why, why doesn't he like me? Why am I not attractive?" They'll just get in their head about it. And I've had uh, even is the weird thing. I've interviewed porn stars in this in this studio, and I've had them and I've asked them. This is why I tell guys to. By the way, this is why I tell guys to be vocal in the bedroom, uh, not just dirty talk, but also just make noise like. Like mm. moan and groan and um and ah actually make some noise because so many from what i hear so many guys are freaking silent and here's what girls will say and here's even a porn star will say this i i'll ask the girl what do you think if what are you thinking if a guy isn't making if having sex with the, you're having sex with a guy and he isn't making any noise what's the thought that goes through your head and these women will say i think he doesn't like me i'm worried i'm wondering what am i doing wrong maybe he doesn't like me whilst his penis is inside of her she's still thinking that thought just because he's not moaning and groaning and making any noise so that that tells you like how much they they kind of value their ability to get a guy off so it's it's okay to tell women what you want in the bedroom and and you know kind of like you said lead them lead them through it lead them through that experience you know and it's almost like what you said if you're not vocal like right there, if she's thinking those things, then now she's in her head and she's less likely to orgasm too, right? Bingo, bingo. Yeah, that's the other thing. Don't get a girl, don't get a woman in her head. Uh, the moment you sort of convey that you're uh, kind of desperate, not me, yeah, de- like desperate to please her. The, the idea of like being needy and desperate and like, Oh, I, I hope I'm as good as her last lover. I hope I can please her in the bedroom. I hope she enjoys me. I really hope I really, really want her to orgasm. I really, really need her to orgasm. The moment you come at sex from that kind of my- mental framework, if she picks up on it, which most women probably will, they'll pick up on that, it puts her in her head and actually makes it l- far less likely for you to actually get her off. Because you've you've added you've pr- you've placed this pressure on her. She's like, oh god damn! Now, now I really, now I have to, I have to orgasm because otherwise he's gonna feel bad, and and then this fucking mental uh, uh, spiral happens. So, don't do yeah. that, guys. <laughs> I'm curious how how important is foreplay to heightening the sexual experience? Just because um, I've found like differences in like, for example, if I'm if I approach a girl at a club or something, and we we're just like conversing making out if the more physical i am and the more sexual we get in public a lot of times that actually decreases my chance of having sex with her that night i've noticed that sometimes Mm. but i've also noticed like my girl for example she like likes to get straight to the point she's like i want sex i want it now no foreplay whereas sometimes i i enjoy foreplay and i've met other girls who really enjoy that foreplay and almost need it to have a better orgasm so what what have you noticed from that you know what, man? I used to be a big foreplay guy when I was in my like twenties. I used to, like I, I I love eating pussy. Not gonna lie, I would just like do I do that a lot, and I'd like get the girl off with my mouth first before we like moved on to stuff. And nowadays, I've totally changed my kind of approach. Nowadays, I'm like I'm a lot more like aggressive and like dominant, and I'm just like like I'll like make out with a girl like and bend her over the counter with her with her clothes still on. You know what I mean? And so I'll jump into it and and. But she'll get into that because it's because it's like that's the kind of stuff that she fantasizes about, you know, all this written about in like Mills and Boone novels or Fifty Shades of Grey or whatever. So I and and um, I'm also a big fan of like kissing girls on the date before you bring them like and actually like making out in public before you bring the girl home. Mm. Uh, and I and I've heard guys say this say say what you just said like it's it it decreases their chances of of getting laid. I'm I'm of the opposite opinion. For me, it's it it seems to have always. I, I mean, it's just kind of who I am. I'm 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 a public displays of affection kind of guy. So I've always yeah. done that. But there's a lot to be said about like taking a taking a girl out of her head. So. What I mean by that is when you're when you're 
bo- both approaches can totally work. Like foreplay can 100%. I know what four, having good foreplay can 100% work and you can get a girl off that way. But I also know that you don't need it, right? So if you enjoy, I'll tell a guy, if you enjoy doing it, then do it. Like, absolutely. Like if you're that, because if, not everybody's the same kind of lover, you know? Some guys are more romantic and slow and passionate. Other guys are more like hard and fast paced and athletic or whatever it is. So it's like, find the style that suits you. Yeah. But when you're uh, like very dominant with a girl and like, like the example I gave a second ago, you know, I'll make out with her and I'll maybe flip her around and bend her over a kitchen counter with her clothes still on. What you're doing there is you're, you're essentially for want of a better phrase, like you're fucking this, the consciousness out of her. Like, so she's not in her head at all because things are just happening it's it's so passionate. It's so it just it just happened. It's magical. It's passionate. Where we 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 we're vibing, or whatever the fuck word you want she'll use, you know, to justify it afterwards. But it's like you're, yeah, like over kind of overwhelming her her conscious rational mind, consensually, obviously, but so that she, because like a woman's orgasm is like so so meant much of it is mental, like you have to get them out of their head in order for them to come. And so one of the best ways to do that is to overwhelm them physically. Just just being a freaking barbarian and taking control of them and, and manhandling them, in my experience, really helps to kind of help them lose control mentally. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I see. What are some of the sex mistakes that you see guys make? Like, do you do you feel like there's a right and a wrong way to be thrusting in other than like the angles, which was money, by the way, right? Yeah. Um, like, is there something to the speed, to the rhythm, to the motion itself? Honestly, I think anything, everything can work. I actually have guys ask, have guys ask me. I did. A, I dropped a vid- I dropped a video about that this week uh, because I had so many dudes asking me that exact question, like, how, like what, like motion in the ocean do I use? And I'm like, man, man everything can work. You know, if is like that's why I think angles are the most important thing, because like yeah, you can change the rhythm. You can like you can go move your your wang left clockwise, anti clockwise, up and down. Like you can change that. You can change the speed and the pace. But if you're not hitting the right spots, it doesn't mean anything. You know, like because that that is one of the big things that people don't understand about porn. Oddly enough, is that like porn sex is not actually great sex. Like what we do on camera is purely for like the viewer. The viewers' pleasure and entertainment. We're, we're like we're, we're we're fucking at like ninety degrees and stuff just to to get you the shot that you need. So, mm. I would say like you if you are if you can you know fuck at a fast pace. If you do that at, with the correct angles, you're gonna get her off quicker. But you can still do that at a slower pace. You know, it's mm. it's all about like the understanding the angles. And we're, we're talking about if we're, if we're trying to make a girl orgasm through vaginal stim- purely from vaginal stimulation. It's all about the angles. Most women will come from clitoral stimulation, like, it, and most women haven't ever come from uh, like penetra- a penetrative orgasm. Oh, really? But, yeah, most of them, because most of them will, because they when they masturbate, they're masturbating their clitoris, right? They're not typically like using a dildo for the most part, like for their whole life, right? Because you, yeah. you have to have a dildo with you, like, <laughs> so they're not learning to orgasm penetratively. But it is possible because everyone has every woman has the same plumbing, the same the same uh, biology, right? Yeah. So. Because that's got that's what a lot of guys want to learn how to do. Like they, they understand like how to make a girl orgasm from from clitoral stimulation. You kind of just copy what she does when she masturbates. That's a big hint, by the way. But learning the angles and learning how to how to hit that G spot with the head of your penis is the key part to actually triggering a, a penetrative orgasm. So that's that's kind of what I, I tell guys. I see. So if a guy has uh, a lot of experience watching porn, right? What are some of those differences? Where you even said like. Porn is actually bad sex. So I can only imagine one, it's probably hard for you. If it's bad sex, then it's probably hard for you to stay engaged with it. So well, what's your kind of tip there? But also, like, what are some of those differences that makes it bad compared to regular sex? Well, it's about it's about the distance. You gotta you gotta create distance between you and her so that so that the camera can see what's going on. Mm. So like a like a doggy style, for example, is the is the worst position in all of porn is doggy style because like for for art, like in real life, it's great, but on camera, it's horrible because you have to like turn your hips so that you can see things going in and out. You have to create distance. I can't like get because I'm a passionate guy. I like to get like up and close and, and in her in her face and stare and stare in the eyes and whisper shit in her ear. But when I do that, if I do that on camera, what happens? My our hips get closer together, and the camera can't see any penetration. So that's kind of what I mean when I say porn sex because because you can't do the stuff you would naturally do if you were 
being passionate with somebody. You have to keep that space between you, so just so the camera can see what's going on. So it's a uh, yeah, there's a it's a bit of a fuck around. Um, what the, I forgot what the second half. I forgot what the second half of the thing you asked was. Um, like, if it's bad sex, then how do you how do you personally oh, stay hard and engage the whole time? Oh well, yeah, yeah, like. I mean, there's still a, there's still a beautiful woman on the on the end of your penis, so that that is yeah. that helps, you know. <laughs> yeah. For the most part, you 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 learn to focus, you know, you focus on the right on the right stuff, and yeah, it's not it's not not enjoyable. <laughs> it's yeah. just not it's not as enjoyable as like regular sex. Yeah, yeah. Is being on a porn set? I I just imagine almost like um. I remember that movie, like the girl next door. I just imagine, like, if you're like the male porn star, do they have like a girl come in and start sucking you off to warm you up before no, you get on camera? They do not exist. Like the fluffers do not exist. Fluffers are not uh, a complete lie. They're a myth. Darn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, darn. If they were, it would be they would be uh, it'd be a much easier job. No, that's it. Does not happen. It's important. Is yeah, they can't afford them. It's really, it's a price thing. They can't really afford them. And here's the thing: they'll, they'll they'll hire the guy that wouldn't. They would hire just hire a guy who doesn't need one, you know. So it's like, all right, that kind of makes it doesn't make financial sense. It's a weird way of saying it. <laughs> I see. Is there is there ever like times where you've had to have uh, a porn scene with a girl that you're like not at all into, but you got to yeah. seem into it? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, it's happened a bunch. What do you do in a situation like that? Like you, you like male porn stars have this ability to like find something attractive about any woman. That's part of mm-hmm. our skill set is we can, we can, we can, even if we don't like the woman, <laughs> like person, either personality wise or physically, right, we'll find something attractive about her. So those, those two things might flip. So if I don't find her physically attractive, I'll find something attractive about her personality or about the way she, mm-hmm. or her, her eye contact. Normally it's like her, the way she looks at me or the way she speaks. Like I'll like lock in, like laser focus on that. And vice versa, if I don't, if I find her annoying and I don't like her personality, I'll find lock in laser focused on something physically about her to like keep myself there. That's that's the key to this whole thing. Is like, I see, but like yeah, it helps if you are actually attracted to the people you're uh, sleeping with. <laughs> that's, yeah. yeah, that's a, for, most guys don't have that problem. Have to deal with that problem at all because that you're not going to go up and talk to a girl in a bar that you wouldn't even be interested. In. You're not even going to take a girl on a date that you wouldn't even be interested in. So that's for most guys. That's something they don't have, they don't actually have to worry about. Yeah. Is there like a line as a porn? Are you still currently active in porn or are you no, mostly I, in not, the coaching right now? I'm not as I do a lot more coaching. I, I, I do still do, do still shoot, but not as much as I used to. I see. Is there a line that when it comes to porn that you would never go there? Like two girls, one cup is like what I'm thinking. Most people would not go that far, you know? Yeah, I don't I don't like that kind of stuff. For, you know, what's funny is that there's I mean, maybe it's not funny for most people. I don't like uh piss play i don't like peeing on girls. i don't i don't pee on girls and that's apparently that's something that most dudes in my industry are like totally they're like cool they're totally fine with it and i'm just for me that's that's my line i'm like i'm not gonna pee on a chick like come on that's <laughs> for me that's my my uh where i draw the line uh yeah and then things do they ever have you do like role plays like have you ever tried to had to pretend to be like someone's stepdad or something oh i am the stepdad that's that's my most common uh role unfortunately i get cast as this i'm i get cast as the stepdad the doctor the teacher the lawyer that's what i get cast Mm. because i'm articulate and i look older uh so they're like all right but sterling you're today you're a doctor bang go ahead uh yeah so i get i get that all the time like step the whole step porn thing is i i don't ask me why that is a thing i don't i can't tell you why all i can tell you is that we shoot the stuff that is popular so we we don't have any say like as the actors we don't have any say whatsoever in what we're shooting we get booked for a for a shoot like okay thursday like 5 a like f- thursday 8 a.m be at this address you're shooting with this girl for this company and then we rock up and we get a script and it's like, you're her stepdad. I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake. And then you just, you just do that. You just do, read the script and do, do the thing you've been told to do. We don't have any say in it. So that is entirely dictated by the, the consumer. We shoot what the studios produce, what the fans are into and what, 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 cause they, they have all the data. They have like the view data and, and they, what gets clicks is what we shoot. So uh, yeah, don't blame me. Blame blame <laughs> blame the blame the people jumping around on Pornhub. Yeah, for real. I've never understood that personally either. But um, I guess like maybe if someone has a really attractive, you know, step 
parent and they <laughs> find that person physically attractive. I don't know. I've never been into that myself. Look, <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't have any step parents or step siblings growing up, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't, know where it, I don't know where it came. I came from. Oddly enough, I came from a like very traditional, like uh, wholesome, uh, uh, stable family. Oddly enough, like the whole the whole stereotype of like I mean maybe not for the, so much for the dudes, but for the for female porn stars at least, there's a stereotype of like oh you must have come from a broken home. Like my parents been together the whole lives, you know. It's like perfect. But yeah, do you find that that stereotype is true? Pretty much, like most of these girls have something, some trauma about them, or a lot of are a lot of porn stars like normal ass people. A lot of them are normal ass people, man. Like, yeah, there are some who fit that stereotype. Absolutely, that's undeniable. But there's a, a a large chunk of them are complete nerds. If I'm being totally honest, there is a lot of girls in porn who are like massive anime nerds, who are board game nerds, who 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 like play video games and stuff. There's a lot of nerds in in our industry and the guys too. Like we're, we're kind of late. I used to I, I used to play video games and shit. Like it's it we're labeled as like these studs or whatever the hell. And behind closed doors, like yeah, we play one on camera. Behind closed doors, we're like I oh, just Xbox and whatever. Like I mean, not not nowadays. I don't do that, but like a lot of dudes do. And it's yeah, it's this weird people building up a sort of persona of who we are on like behind. Uh, behind closed doors just because of, of what we do on camera it's kind of funny I, I find it I find it hilarious at least how most most of these girls are yeah, just aside from the fact that they're taking dick on camera are just regular ass women yeah interesting is there any like as a porn star once you're in the industry is there do you ever get to a certain point where if you wanted to have sex with a certain porn star you'd be able to make it happen through like a few texts or what you, you have well yes and no so for 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 con for content right say for example if i wanted to shoot something for my only fans as a perfect example right and uh i i would just reach out to a girl on twitter and be like if i if i wanted to work with a girl I'd be like hey like would love to shoot content with you um like like whatever like, that's basically what you you just text them uh mm. and sometimes and if they they see the message and they like and, they, and they're interested then yeah that's how you set that up i've done that i've done a bunch of times uh, but for like a mainstream studio for shooting like an official porn scene that will go up on like a website, like someone's subscription site, we have no say in it. Uh, the only people who do have says in it are the, the, the performers who are also like producer directors. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of big name guys who are also producers or directors of their own of like they're, they're contracted out by a bigger company and like, okay, you so-and-so you're going to produce this many scenes this month. And they shoot. They're they're the guy. They're the male talent for the scenes. So they they're like, all right. They pick and choose who they want to work with. That that happens for guys who are contracted to certain companies. So for the for the bigger guys, yes, that is true. But for the mo for most male talent, they don't have a say in anything at all. Yeah. Do you ever worry about the like sexual health? Like, I I want to use condoms or like if this girl's been with so many dudes, like I'm a little skeptical of that. Does that ever cross your mind? Things well, like that. I'm, I'm I'm curious about I'm curious to hear your answer to this as well, uh, but for me, for us, we we get tested every 14 days in our industry, so it's mandatory. You have to get you get all you get a blood pan, blood and urine test for to every 14 days uh, for uh, yeah, all the various STIs. We actually have a really efficient system. There hasn't been a there hasn't been a HIV transmission on on a on a certified porn set for like 20 odd years. Like there's, awesome. they're really good at, at keeping on track because we're, we're all in a we're all in a database, right? And everyone's getting tested every 14 days. And the moment there is any uh, a positive test from anyone in the talent pool, production stops. Mm. And then they test every er, and then so person here caught something, not even HIV, but just say just just say chlamydia or some shit, right? If this person caught chlamydia, okay, production halt. Everyone that they've worked with in the last 14 days is then informed and tested. Mm. And if they come back negative, okay, we're good. If any one of them come back positive, then they repeat the process again. And that's how we I that's see. how we check. Yeah. And, and you know what's funny is this is this is not a government mandated thing. This is an ind this we this is an internal industry thing. We mandate we we do this ourselves, uh, irrespective of like any government body or something. It's like one of the best examples in the world of like industry like self-regulating and an industry self-regulating itself it's actually fucking impressive 
Yeah. Well, I would imagine it has to be impressive with how much money is in the porn industry. Um, yeah. Does that mean like you, like, do you get signed to a certain talent pool? Like, and are there competing pools or is it all kind of governed by the same database? No, that, that is, that's one over, there's only one database basically for like all of the, uh, um, like the STI testing and stuff. Yeah. What about you, man? Like when, when with you, like as do you have do you? I'm curious. Like, do you actually worry about that when you go out and you and you know if you're going out meeting chicks a bunch and, and taking girls home and stuff as a as a dating coach? Do you worry about yeah, like potential STI exposure? Do your students worry? Like, do you have? Here's another question I'll ask you as a follow up. Do you ever have guys who are very very inexperienced with women worrying about that? Ah, uh, well. I do. Here's what I can say is usually when I do my boot camps, I do my boot camps a little bit different to where I do a, a bigger group um, and we control the environment. So I'll bring girls in and we actually critique their banter so they can get actual feedback rather than hoping they find someone to practice on that weekend. Yep. Um, and usually when I do that, um, I'll bring in someone like a, a Susan Bratton because she is entirely like sex education. Right. And mm. so for her, uh, I know a lot of guys get a lot of value out of out of the sex stuff, which is as a dating coach tends to be not necessarily where I talk a lot about um, just because so many guys are so focused on how to even get there in the first place. But um, me personally, right now I have a girlfriend. So like today, I'm not too worried about it because I, I trust my girl and I know I know kind of her history and whatnot. Yep. But, you know, if I'm actively going out and approaching a bunch of women, I would say to a fault, I haven't worried about it as much as I probably should. Um, <laughs> like there's probably been times where I where I didn't use protection, where I definitely should have. Um, but again, kind of just heat of the moment <laughs> type of yeah. thing. I'm not necessarily recommending that for everybody, but I'm definitely not as organized as a, as a database, you know? Yeah. You know, it's funny. That's one of the things I noticed when I moved to America was how often people had unprotected sex here, like way more often than back in Australia. Like back in Australia, I, I for like 15 years, like, no, hang on, like for what, how long did I, for 20, 25 years, I basically always wrapped up unless I was with an exclusive girlfriend. And then I come out here and people and, and girls are like, I have to wear a condom. I'm like, what? <laughs> so it was maybe it's a cultural thing. I don't know. Maybe our sex education is a bit better in America or whatever. But that was one yeah. of the biggest things I noticed when I moved out here was that. I'm not necessarily opposed to it. I think probably it is maybe a, more of a mentality out here to where plan B is so accessible. Like I could walk down to Walgreens at 2 a.m. Mm. in the morning and get a plan B pill and it's fine. Um, right. I mean, depending on your political views, right? But maybe that, maybe that is it. You might be right. You might be onto something there. Maybe that is it. Hmm. Maybe I was just overthinking it. What do you, yeah. okay, what do you, what do you think about like the, the, okay, so we've, we've been, okay, like we've been in like the, the, the whole COVID situation for the last like year, year and a half, Jesus Christ, two weeks, it'll slow the spread, right? Uh, and then, and then the whole OnlyFans thing blew up at the same time, right? What do you think, like nowadays, for like younger guys, like with date are dating apps worthwhile going on? Is cold like is cold approach dead or dying because of that? Are we are uh, are people like being more becoming more and more introverted and just relying on communicating like online instead of doing it in person? Are you noticing any patterns around this? Yeah, I mean, I guess from my perspective, I like to say it's really just how you want to think about it. Um, I think a lot of people on the outside looking in, especially if they're not actively in this industry every day, uh, like you and I am, you know, you might think, okay, you can't approach girls, cold approaching is dead, you have to meet girls with an online site or whatever. Um, and, and but from my perspective, a lot of the guys who come to me, one of the main things they struggle with is meeting women. And usually it's because they're doing the thing that seems to be the easiest barrier to entry, which is let me just create a profile on this random website or this random app. But what you don't know, and this was last time I looked was towards the end of 2020. So I haven't looked at this year's stats, but I assume it's only getting worse every year. But in 2020 alone, um, Tinder was the top grossing dating app on the on the on the entire app store um so that that above netflix above all these different things and it also showed that 80 percent of all users on tinder are men 
right? And so I don't know about you, but if I went to a party and there was 80 dudes and 20 girls, I wouldn't be too happy about that ratio. So that's one aspect. But then the other aspect is, okay, if this is the top grossing dating advice or dating app on the entire top grossing app on the entire marketplace, then who's paying that? It's all these dudes who are struggling to meet the 20% of people on the app who happen to be female. And mm -hmm. you're not even attracted to every one of those 20%. And so the numbers even shriek even more. And so if a guy is struggling to meet women, cold approaching is absolutely not dead. What I would say is you're almost wasting your time letting the middleman be there so that way you can pay the middleman just so he can give you more access to these girls who are already living in abundance where every dude's hitting them up because they're one out of every five people on the app in the first place. And so when I think about just sheer odds of standing out, I want to put myself out of a category of one of 80. I want to put myself in a category of one of one, maybe one of two. So mm. if I'm one of the few people who can approach a girl in a way that's not try hard, force, creepy, face mask or not, if I can talk to her from six, way to way, six feet away, that's still a cold approach. And I think this brings up the other aspect of like so many guys build up this approaching thing to be like, oh, I got to go out and do the cold approach thing to where – it's like they build it up to be more than it is in their head. Like the moment you call it, call it approaching, it becomes like a thing. It's like when a girl says, well, what are we? You know, she's trying to put a label on it, yeah. right? <laughs> because when you put a label on it, now it, it seems like a bigger thing than it is. And so I think because of that, when they think, oh, I got to do the approach thing, it, it becomes more than it is. Are you going to start a conversation with this girl you find attractive or not? And that's what I think it is at the end of the day. Um, and I would say in a, in a sense, depending on how you want to look at it, you know, I would say 2020 is a big opportunity for any guys who want to get into cold approaching because so few dudes are doing it now. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, it's absolutely. How could it not like set you apart? You know, especially if you've got, you know, the young, what, what's the younger generation, the youngest generation right now called like the um, uh, Gen, Gen, Z. Gen Z, right? They're like, they, they're like uh, what you would call like digital natives. Like they grew up on a mobile phone. They grew up with the internet, et cetera. And it's like, if, if, if someone, if you want to say, so, so they've obviously got less sort of social, like face-to-face -face social experience typically than like a millennial or, or a Gen X or whatever. And it's like, if you want to set yourself apart, man, that's hands down like the easiest way just developing those face-to-face -face personal skills but yeah apart okay like are there any places that you kind of like because i thought that was a really good like number that i didn't actually know that number like 80 80 percent of tinder users are chick I, dudes i did not know that that's terrifying uh okay was worse it was 85 percent and 15 percent. so oh my god um, yeah Jesus Christ. so <laughs> so then the, ne the next question I would, I would ask is like where what are some of the best places that you kind of like kind of advise guys to to actually like meet women like in real life face to face because i know it's not th this idea of like uh, i'm gonna approach i i agree with you is it make it puts them in their head and it makes it this big deal right as opposed to it being like okay i'm i'm just this kind of guy i'm the guy who just talks to everyone i'm the guy who's just, i'm just a social guy right and it's like a muscle it's like a reflex action like that's kind of where you want guys to get to right how like so how can guys like well one what are good places for guys to actually do that and practice it and two what some of the steps they can take to just developing that as like a reflex muscle where they just talk to every kind of beautiful woman they see yeah so the way i like to break it down is there's really three main ways if you think about it of meeting women right one is social circle co-workers friends of friends that type of nature most people generally tend to rely on that whether they know it or not um which is why i would not say it's the best way to do it until you have some game and so like having game comes from putting in the reps of cold approach it's like doing door-to-door -door sales you're just going to naturally become a better speaker and presenter of yourself um, by doing that, which allows you the same types of skills that would allow you to build a social circle that kind of brings women to you. But um, so there's social circle, there's cold approach, and then um, there's online stuff, right? And we've already kind of talked about the pros and cons of the online stuff. If you can be one of the top 1% of dudes on there who are actually getting a lot of matches, that's great. But the majority yeah. of guys don't fit into that category. And so when it comes to cold approaching, I would say every guy, regardless of where you're at, that should be your main thing because that's the only one that the more you do that, the better you get at everything else anyways. And so when it comes to that, I like to think of it as, all right, you got social environments and you got non-social environments. And the only real difference here is, is the girl painting chemicals on her face and dousing herself with perfume, just hoping a guy's going to meet, uh, like approach her or right. not. 
Because if a girl is going to the grocery store to grab something real quick, her mentality is very different than a girl who spent the last three hours getting ready to get hit on by dudes, mm. you know? And so what I say is if you can put yourself in social environments more, that's the best play to, place to practice. So, you know, obviously bars, nightclubs, et cetera, but talking about meetups, you know, meetup.com or like beer festivals or like events, conferences. These are the same types of things because just the sheer volume of people there in one small place in a set period of time, two, three hours, I can talk to a lot of people organically in non-forced ways versus if I spent that same three hours at the mall, maybe I'll talk to like four or five chicks, but, um, you know, just the, 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 <laughs> the sheer difference in the amount of reps you can get in a certain amount of time. I would say if you want to get good faster, go to the social environments. Even if you hate bars and nightclubs, even if you think, man, I can never talk to anybody there. It's so loud. I used to think that too, until I actually got good at cold approaching women there. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so if you want to get good at meeting women, cold approach, set it, put it in your schedule, go to a bar or a nightclub or a local party spot, some social event nearby and go there with the intention that you're going to start talking to people because, you know, if, if you're talking to a girl right here, even if she's telling you to fuck off, motherfucker, like, how dare you say that to me? If you don't look like you just got rejected, none of the other people here were listening to that conversation. I turn around and there's another girl to talk to right there. Right. I think that's, so, that's a really good insight for guys. Guys will get in their head about that. They'll be like, oh, what if someone, what if people see me get rejected? Like, bang, like they can't hear you. They don't have a clue yeah. what just happened. Unless she's like slapping you and throwing a glass of water on your face. They haven't got a clue what just happened. So that's kind of like, that's a really, really good piece of, piece of advice right there. Okay. So what? Yeah. And, and here's the thing is like most women nearby, even if they can't hear your conversation, they're at least paying attention to your nonverbals. Like, what do you look like after that interaction? Yeah. Right. And, and so going back to the show, I was telling you about that. I'm working on a, a breakdown I filmed uh, the other day. Um, I'm editing it right now. But one of the dudes on there, he was like with well, the first F boy to get eliminated or whatever. He was this little Asian guy. Um, and he was talking to this like really fine chick on that show. And he was like trying to banter with her, but it just wasn't hitting. And um, the interaction like fizzled out real quickly. She went off and like had someone else come and save her and get her away from this guy because she was getting creeped out by him. Well, anyways, obviously he felt rejected. And so what he did, and this is like the first episode of the show, he went and sat in the back of the room at this party environment where they're there to meet those women. And there's three women. He sat in the back of the room and put his head down and looked rejected the whole fucking night. And then they showed the girls talking about that later on right. saying, I've never seen a guy look so sad. And so that just shows me like, what if that guy had more of an abundance mentality and yes, he struck out with this one girl, but he was still there to have a good time. Now the other girls don't see him sad and he has the opportunity to talk to those other two girls there. Yeah. Right. And so how you come out of an interaction, positive or negative is definitely going to have an effect on your next interaction. You know, absolutely. That's fantastic advice. Um, but ne my next question, I guess then is, after after okay, say guys are getting better at like the cold approaches and stuff and they get they're actually manning up and they're going out there and they're they're, they're you know taking life by the ball so to speak flaking how the hell do dudes deal with flaking in this day and age because there's a lot there's a lot of like i i hear from dudes there's a lot of flaking going on there's because girls have a lot of options like you said like okay take, if he met a girl on tinder i guarantee she's got a bunch of other options because she's like 20%, he's like one of the 80%, she's obviously going to have a lot more options than he is, right? So mm. what what are some ways that guys can typically like help to reduce that or mitigate like th those flakes in their dating life? Yeah. Um, I would say on the on a fundamental core level, and then I'll kind of extrap extrapolate from there, but going back to what you were saying before, if a girl's into you, she's into you, right? And so just kind of act from that frame. And a lot of times, so many guys don't have game, and so many guys are texting these girls like, hey, good morning, beautiful, like, how was your day? To where they're automatically kind of putting themselves in the category of dudes who are just on a, on a chemical level, not attracting her. They're not doing it for her. And mm. so if you can just learn how to talk to women, the better your interactions are going to be anyways. And so just being the guy who has a good interaction with her is going to dramatically decrease the flake rate. You know, I've seen these numbers of, or like these videos that have gone viral way back in the day, you know, like uh, 23 numbers in, in 60 minutes or some shit like that. I promise you the majority of those numbers 
got flaked because you know if you if you talk to a girl for five seconds and then you go you're cute can i have your number and she says okay here you go and then that's the the extent of your conversation with her obviously she's going to be a lot less likely to hit you back or to flake on you versus if you talk to this girl for three hours and there was a lot of sexual chemistry between you guys you yeah. know what i'm saying and so the context of what leads up to the flake matters is this a girl that you've been messaging online and she agreed to hang out with you and then she doesn't show up yeah, obviously that's different than if this is a girl who I cold approach at a grocery store and had a 30 minute conversation with, and then we made out or something like that. Right. And so there's that aspect. But then the other aspect is, you know, um, fuck, I forgot what I was going to, where I was going to take that, but I, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I was going to follow that up with, I guess, then what, what, what are some mistakes? Even you mentioned like the dude who sort of texts her good morning, beautiful, like every day or whatever. What are some like kind of other fundamental mistakes that dudes will make via text? Like in between, say like, okay, I've got the I've got the girl's number, or I met the girl, I matched her with her, or whatever. Between that and actually yeah. meeting up with the girl, like, what do you see that there's some very common mistakes that guys make in their text game? The most common one is especially if we're talking early on in the dating process. Like, this is not a girl you've slept with yet. This is not a girl that you've hung out with multiple times. Is they're they're texting her just for the sake of texting her. They're trying to build a connection with her. They're trying to banter with her over a text. And you know those things are are okay. But early on, within a few text messages, you know from the from the conversation starting. I'm at least planting seeds to meet up with her either that night or the next day or the next, you know, sometime that week. Right. Yeah. So my main priority for even texting her in the first place is to see her in person, because a lot of that sexual chemistry, the, the tension, the attraction, uh, you know, there's no you can't you can't substitute doing that over text for doing that in person. The guy who can do that in person is going to be top of mind, tip of tongue for her more often than the guy who's just texting her all day, every day. Yeah. So uh, that's like the main one that I see, you know, because I've, I've heard girls complain about that before on uh, on dating apps, especially like convers the conversation that goes nowhere because the dude isn't like isn't he's not pushing for a meetup. He's not pushing for, a, you know, like any like he's not making things happen. So she's like, yeah, I'm like I'm chatting with him, but like they get frustrated when the dude isn't like, all right, let's just meet up eight o'clock Thursday night, this place, whatever. They, yeah. they're getting like, they're complaining about it and they're getting frustrated by it. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, uh, and this goes back to the point I, I forgot I was going to try to make was on the other aspect, if I, if I get flaked on by a girl, you know, I, I, I rarely, if ever let that get me down for the rest of the day, because I'm a busy guy. I got things going on. I'm just like, cool. Now I can actually still work on this thing that I was already working on because yeah. I got goals. I got things I'm working towards. And so, you know, one of the things that you and I mentioned even before we hit record was like, you know, you value your time. That's like a trait of high value men. A guy who's high value, who values his time, who prioritizes his own time, he's not going to waste his whole fucking day texting this girl just for the sake of texting her, yeah. right? He's going to be efficient with this time. All right, we're texting. You know, you got you, you are, you're into me. I'm into you. That's kind of the vibe here. All right, let's meet up, right? He's being more efficient. And that way you can build that conversation in person. And so not only does that show her that you're a high value guy, whoops, camera. Um, not only does that show her that you're a high value guy because you're not you're not dilly dallying, you're not trying to just text her for the sake of texting her, yeah. but also you understand how it works. You understand that you you want to do this in person. That's where the fun happens, you know. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. You can't you can't really like you can be like witty and 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 kind of charming and funny over text, but it's not it's never going to be anywhere near as good as you know face to face. Like like I can communicate so much more with my eye contact and my my vocal tonality alone. Than I could ever do via like text messages. That's actually why I I personally like sending voice notes whenever I can, because like oh, it's it's, awesome. it's just so much. There's so much more there. It's like I could say so, I, and and look, the accent doesn't hurt. I'm not gonna lie. Like <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of useful, but it's this little thing. Like uh, like I personally hate receiving voice notes from if someone I'm like You're wasting my fucking time you piece of shit if I have to play, play some dude's voice note if like a friend of mine is sending me a voice note but I'll do it to chicks <laughs> because I, it's an advantageous for me you know I like what you said about the voice notes I think that's a underutilized thing when it comes to just communicating with a girl over your phone um, mm. and one of the things that I've noticed is like uh, at least in my experience um, if a girl's not responding to me over text a lot of times 
a guy will take that as like, oh, she's not into me, right? But sometimes, you know, I found that if a girl's not responsive over text, she's very responsive over an Instagram or a Snapchat DM. Or if mm. she's not even responsive on those, she always picks up my phone call when I call. And so for me, if I'm if I'm shooting my shot with a girl, um, I'm not going to be texting her all day, but you know, if she doesn't hit me back this week, I'll, I'll wait a week and then I'll call her. I, ch I just change up the medium. And sometimes yep. you'll, you'll realize that, oh, this girl's interested. She just prefers phone calls or she prefers huh. Snapchat DMs. You know, that is a really, really good piece of advice. That's a gold, that's a gold nugget right there. Just change the medium. Cause it's, yeah. cause it's like, a, it's a, it's a case of like, where are you competing most for attention like it, it like maybe like she has a, she gets a ton of tech for some reason she gets a ton of text messages but she doesn't get that many instagram dms so it's like yeah that, that is i like that that's fucking that's a nugget right there yeah um yeah, patrick 100%. where where is the best place for everybody to find you in yeah, terms of so social, check out my YouTube. You, yep for sure um uh, my youtube is my main platform i i post a little bit on my Instagram, but my main priority is my, my YouTube. So youtube.com slash Patrick James. Um, or if you want to connect with me on Instagram, um, that's where definitely a lot of my, my fans from YouTube will find me as well and reach out. Um, it's at the real Patrick J. But other than that, it's pretty simple. My name is Patrick James. My company's raw dating advice. I'm sure you'll see me around. Okay. Yeah. Go check him out. Go check out raw dating advice. Uh, the channel is really good. Like, by the way, the, his YouTube channel is really, really good. So I highly recommend you guys check it out. A lot of, a lot of gems on there.